I warmly welcome you, dear brothers and sisters, on another expedition through the book of Leviticus. It is indeed a privilege to study the Word of God together, and I pray that the Spirit of God will open your eyes to new truths about Himself and that He'll bless our time together today. Hebrews 10, 29 reminds us that God is a consuming fire. The two sons of Aaron found this truth out the hard way. The moment they made the offering, we find that fire came out from the presence of the Lord. Worship is not to be taken trivially as indicated by this event. Why would God hand out such a harsh punishment? Well, this was just the beginning of the priestly service. And if God had allowed this event to pass, then they would disobey the entire law. God needed to show the consequences of ignoring His statutes and how much care they have to be in their service to prevent any form of deviation. The tabernacle was all about God and His nature. Nothing that distorted His true image or nature could be permitted. Think about it. Those who came to collect the bodies were instructed to remove them from the courtyard. Nadab and Abihu perhaps were not even inside the sacred tent, but just in the courtyard as we read in the verse. The lack of mourning and the prohibition of this place like the rending of clothes, so that they should not sympathize with the sinners. The priests are also instructed to abstain from alcohol while entering the sanctuary, showing that they are to have a clear mind while being in the service of the Lord. Any excuse for mistakes or forgetfulness on grounds of being intoxicated will not be tolerated. The Lord's work is serious, and His preeminence cannot be compromised under any circumstance. Uzzah reached out to stop the ark from touching the ground, but his intrusion into the holy domain was not welcomed as he was struck down. Dear friends, let us continue to learn prayerfully of the seriousness of dealing with God's holiness. Come, dear friend, to Through the Bible. The holiness of God is set forth at the beginning of the Age of Grace. Remember by the incident concerning Ananias and Sapphira? Please turn with me to Leviticus chapter 10. Now here, this is another blot on man's long and sordid history of sin and willfulness. It is the record of the rebellion and disobedience of the two sons of Aaron. It follows the glorious day of dedication recorded in the preceding chapter. So often we find this happening. After a flush of victory, there is defeat, as in the book of Joshua. The victory of Jericho is followed by the ignoble defeat at Ai. The presumption of Nadab and Abihu is frightening in the light of the clear teaching which God gave at Sinai. It says in Exodus chapter 19, verse 22, it says, And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. In Exodus chapter 30 verses 34 to 38, God gave to Moses the formula for the incense to be used in the tabernacle and said, As for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. That was from Exodus chapter 30, verses 37 and 38. The holiness of God is set forth at the beginning of the age of law by this incident. The holiness of God is set forth at the beginning of the age of grace. Remember by the incident concerning Ananias and Sapphira? Death was the drastic penalty in both cases. Our God is holy, and He deals with His children on that level. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12 verse 29. Now that is something we all need to learn today. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11. This is something we need to recognize today. Too often we forget about that, that God is holy, that He is a consuming fire, and that when He is upset, the terror of the Lord, we've got to be very distant. We cannot just take God too lightly. Now there is a warning here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. 
It says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. This is one of the great sins of the hour. People are not hearing what God has to say in his word. Now the incident concerning Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon. This is verses 1 and 2. And offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. This is Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Now it may be argued that the penalty of death was too severe too severe for the transgression committed. But notice particularly what God says here. Which he commanded them not. Now this reveals something of the enormity of the crime, and therefore the penalty is just. This was willful, deliberate disobedience to the expressed command of God. Precisely what did they do which brought down such severe judgment upon them? This act has been called will worship, and that is what it is. What did they do wrong? What was it? Now, let's make three suggestions. Now, the first one, they probably did not light the censer of incense from coals from off the altar, which was the fire which had come down from heaven. It apparently was understood that this must be done. This was the practice on the great day of atonement, as is clearly stated in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 12. It says in verse 12 of chapter 16, And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Now this was the same ritual which followed at the time of the rebellion of Korah. Numbers chapter 16 verse 46. It must be assumed that this method was the only correct one. The ritual they followed was contrary to God's way. Now the second suggestion. Their timing was out of step with the God-given ritual. The ritual for the day had been completed. They should have consulted Aaron in this matter. Apparently they wanted to repeat the marvelous display of the preceding chapter. Now isn't this a problem today? when with our will worship we try to duplicate what God has done. There are many who try to duplicate the experience of the day of Pentecost. Now God is sovereign. His will must be followed even as to the timing. The Spirit of God will move according to His own will. We should simply make ourselves available and obedient to Him. Thirdly, others have supposed that they intended or that they intruded beyond the veil which was expressly forbidden. This is justification for their viewpoint as stated in Leviticus chapter 16 verses 1 and 2. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark that he die not for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat it would seem that this prohibition came out of the incident of Nadab and Abihu they were wrong as to the place they should come God had commanded them as to the manner the time and the place They were wrong in all three. Some may still think that God surely uses extreme surgery. It does reveal that our God is a jealous God. He is sovereign in all his dealings, and those who come to him must come to him on his terms. It is still true that uh, to obey is better than sacrifice. God will not accept worship in our own will, no matter how sincere. We need to note here that the high position of these men offered them no immunity. The sudden execution of judgment here is startling. There is no escaping the statement that the fire was from the Lord. 
let us recognize that judgment is not foreign to the age of grace. It may not always be this sudden. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, it says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, it was just as sudden and sure. This does not mean that the believer in Christ can lose his salvation. Nadab and Abihu and Ananias and Sapphira did not lose their salvation. Neither did the believers in the Corinthian congregation. This is made very clear. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 31 and 32. Physical death is oftentimes a judgment for the child of God. There is a sin unto death. I hope you listen in carefully. There is a sin unto death, but it is physical death. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. The child of God is not condemned with the world. These judgments in both the Old and New Testaments are examples to believers that will worship is detestable to God. The believing sinner must worship God God's way. Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 22 tells us very definitely that we are to come to God with boldness and uh, that it must be by the blood of Christ. We come because we have an high priest over the house of God. We are to come with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. God makes a difference. And that he may put difference between holy and unholy, and between clean and unclean. Leviticus 10.10 10. Now don't get the idea that God can't move in with judgment today. Now let me get very personal. A friend of Vernon Meggie, who knew him very well, said, Meggie, since you have had cancer and you know you still have cancer in your body now, did it ever occur to you that maybe it is a judgment from God? Now Maggie told his brother, You know, I have waked up in the stillness and darkness of the night and I have thought just that and I have cried out to God. Now Maggie goes on to say, I don't exclude myself. If we don't judge ourselves, God will judge us so that we are not condemned with the world. I hope you are able to understand. I think it's important for us to be able to constantly evaluate, you know, all the struggles and the hardships that we go through. It may be God's way of actually disciplining us or causing us to evaluate and think about our life. Now, are you going through some sickness? Are you going through some hardship? Well, it may be God's way of just getting your attention. I think it would do you good to stay still, reflect, and find out what God is allowing. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that goes wrong in your life is God's judgment upon you. No, not at all. But there are certain things it would be good for us to simply reflect on that and find out whether God is actually trying to get your attention to straighten out your life. God does all things well. What an illustration this is that sometimes Jesus will come in fiery judgment upon the lost world. You know, Enoch preached this, remember? Enoch prophesied, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is Jude 14 and 15. You know, Peter also said the same thing. He says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now let's move on to verses 3 and 5 of Leviticus chapter 10. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified, 
and Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their courts out of the camp, as Moses had said. Now when the news spread throughout the hosts of Israel, the people must have gathered about the tabernacle to view the dead bodies of these young men. Moses quoted the words of the Lord to give them an explanation for the judgment. Verse 22 of Exodus 19, And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. Those who have been brought into a particular nearness to God must exercise a sharp insight into the holiness and the righteous demands of God. Amos 3.2 says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. As God judged his people, God judges the believers, his saints today, in order that the world may know that he is a holy God. Aaron's attitude here and conduct are noticeable. He maintains an attitude of silence. There is no cry of disappointment, grief or resentment toward God. He bows in heartbroken submission to the will of God. His grief must have been deep, but he can say nothing. Nothing against the sovereign will of God. You notice God says, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. Moses called upon two of the priests who were cousins of the slain men to remove the dead bodies from before the sanctuary. As the people looked on in awe, they were carried out of the camp. Now the instructions coming out of the incident. And Moses said unto Aaron, and unto Eleazar, and unto Ithamar his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. This is verses 6 and 7 of Leviticus 10. A restriction is placed on Aaron and his two remaining sons. They were not to mourn outwardly. Now there is a twofold reason for this. The first is clearly stated. The anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. They were set aside to represent the people before God and they were God's representatives before the people. They were to continue in their office that there might be a mediator between God and man, lest wrath should come upon the people and the judgment of death be upon them. In the second place, they were not to show the outward signs of mourning, which would contradict the action of God in judging their loved ones. It must be added that they must have gone about their office with sad hearts. They were serving God and there must be no evidence of rebellion against him. Verses 8 and 9 And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute for ever throughout your generations. It would appear from this instruction that Nadab and Abihu had acted under the influence of alcohol. This is one of the finest examples in scripture against the use and abuse of alcohol or drugs. The priest is to serve the Lord with a clear, steady and a sober mind. Now today there are plenty of advocates of the use of drugs in faith, in, in our gatherings, in religion. My friend... God despises such an approach to him. This is the same thing that God meant when he said, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 
The believer is to draw his dynamic and his zeal from the Spirit of the Lord and not from frail and human props. What a lesson this is against drugs and alcohol for us today. Now verses 10 and 11. And that E may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. And that E may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord had spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. The use of wine dulls the senses so that a sharp distinction cannot be made between the holy and the unholy. True values are distorted and there is a breakdown in morals as a result of the use and abuse of alcohol. The priest must keep the statutes of the Lord so that he can teach them to the people. It is the filling of the Holy Spirit that is needed for the study and teaching of God. The priesthood was just inaugurated and the very first response from the sons of the chief priest was disobedience. Is this pattern not familiar? In the garden after God had blessed Adam and Eve with authority over all things, they resort to disobeying Him and causing the fall. After the flood, God establishes a covenant with Noah, but we soon see Him get drunk and shame Himself. He ends up cursing His son for slavery. At Sinai Mountain, we see the children of Israel witnessing God, making a covenant with them amid His terrifying and matchless glory. But as soon as we see, Moses goes up to receive the instructions of the tabernacle to make his dwelling among them. They resort to idolatry. In the Gospels, we also see Peter and other disciples abandon Jesus on the same night he had inaugurated his new covenant in the Passover. Peter, who had witnessed his transfiguration and other signs, even deny him. All of the above incidents happened at a time of significant covenants which shaped the salvation story of the scripture. One thing that is clear here is how God, despite human failures, continues to pursue His plan to bring salvation to man. He had every right to cancel His covenant with us lesser beings who failed Him numerous times. He loves us despite our failures and sinful nature. Let us take worship as a serious matter, brothers and sisters. God bless you as you continue to reverence and honor Him. Thank you.